Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Rachel Bouchard, and I will be guiding today's conversation. We welcome you to our From the Studio series, sponsored by EPCOR's Heart and Soul Fund, as well as the Canada Council for the Arts. Here at the gallery, we embrace the teachings of Tatua, a Cree phrase meaning, welcome, there's room. In our house, even the virtual one, everyone is welcome. Before we... Uh-oh. interdisciplinary art practice includes okay, you're back. drawing, photography, digital image creation, and the creation of short animated films. Paul Freeman attended the Alberta College of Art and Design and was awarded the Governor General's Award for Academic Excellence as a graduate of 1998. He received his MFA in Drawing and Intermediate from the University of Alberta in 2005. Freeman is the founding artist at the Nina Haggerty Centre for the Arts an art center with developmental disabilities in Edmonton, where he was the artistic director between 2002 and 2019. The Art Gallery of Alberta nominated his exhibition, It's Only Natural, for the Eldon and Ann Foot Visual Arts Prize, which he received in June 2013. Freeman was a recipient of the Edmonton's Artist Trust Fund in 2017 and has been commissioned by the city to create sculptures the New Valley Line LRT at Avonmore Station. So can you take this time with me to welcome to artist Paul Freeman. Hi. Hello, Paul. How are you? Thank you for joining Good, us. thanks. We really appreciate you taking the time. Well, thanks for asking me. Yeah, so uh, let's just dive in. So um, this this series is printed directly from objects that are placed on the glass of a photo photocopier. Um, can you tell us a bit about the concept that you're working through? Sure. When I was a, a student at the Alberta College of Art and Design, I started as a jewelry major, or sorry, I started as a yeah jewelry major. And in the course of the required drawing classes, I I I don't know if I was just feeling a little bit cheeky or a little frustrated, a bit of both, I suppose, I decided I could solve every drawing problem presented to me with a color photocopier. And so I started making images using one of those old Canon CLC 700 color copy machines, the first color copiers that were out. So around 1994, 1995, I started playing around with a color copier. And in the course of those explorations, I got so excited about what I was doing that I shifted my major. I left the jewelry program and I did what is called an interdisciplinary studies degree. So at that time at ACAD, you, you could select a mentor or two, ask them to support you in developing a project of study that was not really, didn't really fit in anywhere else. And so I maintained my jewelry practice, but I did a lot of work uh, creating images on the color copier. And the image on the left of the mallard yeah. is um, something that the Alberta Foundation for the Arts bought for me pretty much right after I got out of art school, I think. Okay. And um, eventually I left the color copier behind. It got harder and harder to access the machines and to do such weird stuff. And I, and I just switched over to using a scanner. But essentially the process was the same of going out into the world and looking for or finding natural objects, often dead animals, and then yeah. bringing them to the color copier at, or to the scanner and composing on the glass. Yeah. Yeah, I like the juxtaposition of the live. Well, I mean, they're, they're not, they're not, um, I mean, the cut flowers that are still, um, they haven't wilted as, as in comparison to the, the animals, the birds. Yeah, well, for me, the exciting, I mean, aside from the, you know, the exciting uh, process of just experiment and, and play, 
that yeah. drove a lot of this work. You know, I really got excited about, well, the kind of impact it was having on other people and the opportunity to play with scale. So at a certain point, all of these images got really, really large, like cinema screen scale images. Yeah. And, you know, I got really interested in, I mean, on the surface, it was about thinking about being vegan and thinking about animal rights and things like that. Looking at them today, I don't really read them that way. They're much more personal metaphor and kind of make me think about the life I had back then. Right. But um, the attraction and repulsion that happen with these dead animals mediated by the image, you know, the way that you can be drawn into looking at all the detail and then pushed back by the reality of what you're looking at. So for me, that was the exciting part. Yeah, I, I have a question for you. Um, did you submit these pieces in your classes, Paul? Um, if so, what did your professor think? Oh, yeah, I submitted. I was, um, that's all I would do. I wouldn't draw it all anymore. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, I submitted them all. I had the right teachers, I guess. They were able to buy in to what yeah. I was doing. Yeah. And willing to talk about <clears throat> them conceptually as drawings, at least. And so, no, I got, I got just, I got good feedback and I um, rapidly shifted from thinking about becoming a jeweler into being this guy who makes these photocopies. And yeah. by the time I graduated, that was, I mean, I had maintained my jewelry classes to get my degree, but my focus for sure was making these images. Okay. All right. Um, all right, so this slide is, this series was titled Full Frontal Lobe, is that right? Yeah, or sometimes I call it Mind Control Tricks. Because for me, that's what this body of work was all about. You know, um, I've been a serial parent. I have a 28-year-old, a 14-year-old, or a 13-year-old, and a 4-year-old. And yeah. so I spent a lot of my life, like most parents, confronting the reality that I was either going to develop some mind control or resort to force. <laughs> and obviously resorting to force isn't a great option. Yeah. Jedi so mind it made me think about all the mind control I was engaging in. Yeah. Just as a survival mechanism and as a way of um, trying to be a good parent. And yeah. uh, then thinking more broadly about the way, you know, particularly through media, through images, um, there's a lot of mind control tricks going on, whether it's fast food or images of masculinity yeah. or femininity. Um, I think we are, we are pushed around quite a bit. So I was just kind of yeah. playing with that. And the reason for the matador and the brain uh, kind of comes from looking at the history of, of mind control technique. And one of the things that happened in the sixties was a, a doctor named Jose Delgado started and those putting pieces, implants right? into, in bowl, into bowls and putting them in the ring with matadors and controlling the bowl. And yeah. so that's how it all got started. Uh, so um, is there any play on the fact that you've, you've only focused on the frontal lobe and, and there's that disconnect between the uh, parietal and the occipital and, and the temporal? Is, that, is, is, there, is there anything to that? Like I don't know how much of it was <laughs> front of mind back then when I was making yeah. these works, but certainly today I have a, a, a deeper understanding of my own um, brains, the different yeah. brains inside my head and how often I've been uh, through my life, been very driven and ruled by maybe the lower brain. And so yeah. in some ways I was thinking about these as being like mind control sometimes is about um, ideas and thoughts, but sometimes it's about getting at the bottom of the brain, activating those right. more reptilian urges. Yeah, yeah, and even the idea of the the um, uh, the the lesions that would be created from, in this case, the the whip, you know, and the the consequence of that in the frontal lobe. That's interesting. Um, we have a question. What was the process? Mm -hmm. Where did you source your imagery, if you did? Oh, sure. Absolutely. I, uh, like most contemporary artists, I love Google, right? Love the internet. 
it's such a great place to find images. So in a lot of my drawing practice, I have done quite a bit of bucket filling where I just yeah. go online. I've spent, you know, two days looking at images of safari hunts and all those dead animals and just kind of filling the bucket with stuff. So I have folders yeah. in my computer full of images of, well, deer, full of images of uh, pinup boys and girls and so i have a, a mind control bucket in my computer <laughs> that i just started dumping things into yeah and i found this really great pdf produced by the mayo clinic the big okay. american uh hospital and yeah. so it was a, a document developed by people who were going to have surgery on their brain and in this pdf there was a 3d brain that you could turn around Oh and, wow! And position at any angle. So I use that brain, yeah. that John or the Mayo Clinic yeah. brain, and the cursor to just manipulate the brain into different positions. And then I used Photoshop and a kind of cut and paste strategy to bring the images I was finding on the web together yeah. with these images of the brain. And then basically, it's a tracing project. After that, playing with line weights to try to create a little bit of space and. Um, you know, I'm not. I am not that that kind of draftsman who could just whip this pen and ink drawing off in one flourish with no pencil marks. Or it's a tracing project for sure. Okay, okay. Um, I have a comment. Uh, the limbic reptile brain! Exclamation mark. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this one, uh, service erectus. Um, what can you? This guy has some serious mutations. Um, I'm wondering why you used a uh, buck and and um, why what's with all of the the mutate what's with the mutation? Sure. I uh, when I graduated from the University of Alberta, when I did my master's degree, I did a whole bunch of sculpture yeah. where animals, children were all getting, they were mutating. They were maybe getting infected by the natural world. And one of those pieces, actually, since I have it right here, I'll grab it. Um, <clears throat> one of those pieces was this guy who was on display at the Shaw for a while. And uh, okay. oh, yeah, yeah, had all these sticks growing out of him. And, and so one day I was driving I think, to Calgary and I saw the big elk on the side of the road cast elk on the side of the road and I thought hey wouldn't it be cool if I mean really that was the beginning of the project which I think yeah. is the beginning of a lot of projects honestly um and then the real motivations take a long time to emerge for me but those impulses are pretty strong and yeah. so I got inspired to take that idea that I developed in my graduate exhibition and bring it into these deer and switch from sticks to antlers. And for a very long time, I talked about this work as being about a whole set of ideas that I don't connect to nearly as easily anymore. But certainly when I was drawing and making these works, um, which were shown in uh, an Alberta biennial, these drawings, mm -hmm. okay. they were, the ins my inspiration was always to make sculpture. And came to my studio and visited. They said, well, we like the drawings so much. It'd be a shame if you made sculptures and we only wanted drawings. Why don't you focus on drawing? And so that's how this big drawing, which again, the Alberta Foundation for the Art Zones this was one. created. And yeah, for a long time, I talked about these objects, these animals, the drawings, whether they're drawings or sculptures, as being about kind of a metaphor for a growth-centered economy, a metaphor for Alberta kind of being all in on oil and gas and not having a very diversified outlook. So sort of like being all about one idea or having one, being over-invested or like too much of a good right. thing. And then right. um, in preparation for... <clears throat> so after these drawings were made, yeah, I applied to the Alberta Foundation for the Arts and a couple of years later to the Edmonton Arts Council and got some money together to actually build the sculptures I'd always dreamed of making. They were, and it, they're easy to make now, but they were really hard to figure out at the time how to 
put everything together, how exactly to make it work. And um, yeah. I had a great time showing these at the Art Gallery of Alberta. And even so then, this was I don't think I... This was in the RBC New Works Gallery okay. at the Art Gallery of Alberta. And I mean, as you can tell, the AGA has been a very important part of my life for a very long time. Ever since I was a little yeah. boy, I've been taking classes there. I got my first teaching experiences at the AGA. I had some ex significant exhibition experiences there as well. So I take a moment now to just thank the AGA profusely for all their support over the years. I am very grateful to be asked to speak to you today. And thanks to Catherine and everyone there for uh, for helping me become the artist I am today. So um, Supporting after local. this exhibition came and went, I really couldn't let this drop. I put yeah. another big proposal together. I found some more money and I started a new project, which was to take these animals and now they're deer, not elk, but these antlered forms and yeah. do a whole new exhibition, which um, I showed at Gallery 501 in Sherwood Park and at La Cité over at the Faculté Saint-Jean. And that's and this, I love this image is from 501, is that correct? This is from 501. This image is from 501. Yeah. The two shows were fairly different in terms of one had everything hanging at eye level and the La Cité show had everything hanging way up in the air. But oh, prior yeah, to that would be so. Yeah, they were that quite would be different. Such a... Yeah, the perspective. And that gold, that, the gold um, hanging ball of antlers is is behind me now and in, in my house. It lives in my living room now. Um, wow. But Prior to this exhibition, you know, I've been writing, I've been talking, I've developed artist statements, all that stuff. I didn't feel right about it. I was feeling more and more and more uncomfortable as the exhibition date loomed. That, okay, um, why so? Aside from the fact that I was not sure that that big black and gold sculpture wouldn't fall down on the ground. It had only hung in my studio for about 18 hours before I hung it up. So I had oh. a, a, some serious moments of, of dread over the weekend, but Monday yeah. it was still hanging there and it's still fine. Um, yeah. But I was, I had um, been seeing a counselor for a couple of years at this point. And so I had a pretty good relationship with her. My life had undergone some pretty big change and I was, um, I'm very grateful to Janet for all the help she's given me. But one thing that she did for me was she came to my house. She sat in this room with me, which had, seven of the sculptures hanging from the ceiling. Okay. So we were under this fairly oppressive cloud yeah. of antlered deer. And we could maybe slip to the next side and show okay. show what those looked like. Oh, no, it's the one after, I guess. Oh, okay. We'll go back to this one. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, wow. So we sat underneath all of these, and they were packed quite tight together. Wow. And I just said, I don't believe I know what I'm doing. I don't believe I know what this show is about. I know there's something much more important happening here. Yeah. Why did I have to make nine of these things? I already made two. Like, what am I trying to say to me, myself that yeah. I'm not able to hear that's making me do this over and over again? <laughs> and I had, like I said to you before, what feels like a very simple set of thoughts, but they were hard to come to. Epiphany, I think, often seems easy after the fact yeah. but I just came to realize that these works were much more about discovering that through a lifetime you can acquire a whole set of coping mechanisms strategies for survival that maybe worked at one point in your life but without letting them go you can't really move on so essentially yeah. I think I was saying to myself over and over again maybe you gotta let these antlers go maybe you got to let your antlers drop maybe you got to set aside some of your defenses right and yeah. so for me the show really didn't come together until kind of a day or two before exhibition and then I was really able to speak about it and I think a much more effective way and I've always thought gosh I need to go back to this work and finish the show I need to have a, a set of sculptures where this buck has shed his antlers He's reintegrating yeah. into the herd. There's like a, a coming back to the group after realizing so that you've 
got all this stuff. Over so for me, it was a pretty big deal. Yeah, yeah, of ego or or status, mm. whatever that that the symbolism of the um, the antlers are. Um, okay, so I have a question for you. Do you use real antlers? So the antlers, of course, they were like they're cast from life, but I have molds that I've made. So okay. I have some real antlers. I also have some plastic antlers that I bought from Taxidermy Supply. And okay. I make my molds. And all of these are cast with a product called Smooth On 320, which is a off white two part resin. And okay. I put some stuff, I forget the technical term. But it's like a micro balloon. It's a little glass balloon. So the my you know my whole idea behind this project was to try to keep these animals as light as possible. Right. And so I think each animal weighs about 150 pounds, well, which is not bad considering yeah. it only weighs about 60 pounds before it has all its antlers on it. Wow. So um, yeah, the whole project, if anyone's curious, is uh, polyurethane core with an armature inside. And then for this, for these sculptures, I used a product called uh, Freeform Air, which is a two-part epoxy clay, again, okay. full of these mi micro bubbles. Um, and I, I skinned all the foam with that, with that epoxy. I used a styrofoam pad or a silicone pad that I made. I stole some marks from a very, very good artist named Cheryl Anhel over at Nina Haggerty. Okay. I got one of her discarded uh, lino plates and I made a silicone stamp from her marks that I used to uh, texture all the clay but, on okay. the outside of these deer. And then there's a fairly complicated, again, a simple idea when I finally came up with it, but all these antlers have to come out for shipping, for transport. And all these animals right. have to hang upside down. So basically, I don't know that we can see it very well in these pictures, but every large antler is on a square rod that goes into a square hole inside the body that's sheathed with aluminum. So it's like a metal hole that the, right. that the, a metal tube that my square stock can go into. And I've mm -hmm. drilled a little hole through the tube into my square. And I have a small, antler on a threaded rod that goes through a nut and spins in and locks the antler in place. So every big antler is paired okay. with a small antler and there's a kind of key and lock system to keep everything together. It oh, took me a very long time to figure out how yeah. to do that. I and it bet. was one of those um, falling asleep after having filled the bucket with how am I going to solve this problem? Falling asleep yeah. one day, I thought plastic straws. Wait a minute. <laughs> Nothing will stick to a plastic straw. And I found a way to set up channels and guides and get all this stuff to work. So the okay. technical part is always pretty fun, you know? Yeah. And um, the dreaming up is always a lot of fun. Right. Right. Um, I have another question for you. Mm -hmm. Was there a difference in how they read that you were exploring regarding different, uh, the different hanging heights from one show to the next? Well, it sure read differently. In my mind, as I was building the project, La Cité was always my spot. Okay. I always thought that would be a great place to put these because there's so much vertical space. The height, yeah. Um, I, they, are, they, uh, they were quite different shows. I mean, you'd have to ask someone else <laughs> who's not so intimate That's with the work. That's interesting, too, just... Just the idea of them hanging as like a cloud above you. And then it's like, then mm. now you're talking about consciousness and, you know, subconsciously, you know, how ego gets in the way often. And and so it it would play on that for me, if, depending on, on the height of it, where, mm -hmm. where it felt mm -hmm. more like a cloud hovering above rather than I um, at eye level. Yeah, I think there was a little more of an exuberant atmosphere in the La Cité show when things were up. This was, well, obviously much more in your face. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, so should we go back to the chair? Do you want sure. to discuss the chair? Sure. That's okay. Fine. I, I love that piece. I just think just the idea of whoever sits on that and then having the protection from both sides, but, um, mm -hmm. or maybe it's defense being defensive. 
Well, I made this piece for uh, an opportunity again at the AGA. They had a refinery party around Halloween. Okay. And so I was invited to make something for the show. And again, it just kind of came to me. I could see this object in my mind. I got pretty excited about how to put it together. Yeah. And what was really fun was the night of the party, they set up a light so that people could take their photographs in the chair. It was mm -hmm. really fun to watch people sit in this thing. Oh, and, that's And fantastic. how immediately their their whole body would change. Yeah, and they would I all bet. adapt these crazy, haughty, kind of power-driven poses. Yeah. And yeah. for sure, the piece is a, you know, when I look at it now, I see these arms reaching forward, the king's arms reaching out to get you. And it is, it's this kind right. of, I think a bit of a push and pull. There's this uh, feeling of being protective, but there's also a, a pretty offensive, pretty like, there's no getting Absolutely. close to this person Absolutely. sitting in the chair. I love and I think really for me cool. in the statement, kind of about, you know, feeling like you can just take whatever you want. That the that it's sort of like this feeling of um I think I called it potent take. Like you can just this attitude of the world is yours for the taking seems to be right. the attitude most people adopt when they sit in the chair. Yeah, I we have quite a comment from Sarah. She said so many people have told her that the chair reminds them of the show Hannibal. <laughs> oh yeah, I get that a lot for sure. Do you really? Uh, yeah. I mean, I hadn't seen any of that. I've seen it all now. I hadn't yeah. seen any of that when I worked on this work. But yeah, those references are pretty common for sure. Uh, all right, and now this. No, and again, this I'm very grateful to the AGA for having it in their shop at Art Sales and Rental. I don't know how I would handle that chair at home between the dog and the <laughs> kids. Like it really needs another spot. So I'm very grateful that they've given it a home. Yeah. Yeah. You, well, you could use it as your, you know, your uh, recliner. The, mm -hmm. it's, it's a power position. The kids, you know, when you're talking about mind control. <laughs> <laughs> I When I'm I, laying down the law, <laughs> when I'm saying you won't like what happens next. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, so tell me about this drawing, this rendering, I guess. So, this for the yeah, app. these are just, this is for the Avonmore LRT. Yeah. The project, we've been talking about the project for four years. It's been a very long process of figuring out the engineering, the, uh, maybe the simplest way to put it is that there's a big space often between the idea of making things and the making of things. Right, And so bringing those spaces closer together so I can actually make the thing has taken yeah. quite a bit of time. Yeah. And because the placements of these sculptures, there's a sculpture or an art project going up on every station in the line. Yeah. Um, so Steph Johnson, I know, is doing mute art. There's a bunch of artists, much art, sorry, uh, yeah. doing, doing stations. Hers, I think, is going to look really, really great. I'm excited to see it. And... Um, I love how every playful sculpture they are. is going on top of the canopy that you would stand under when you're waiting at the station. So oh. when I made this drawing, I thought I was going to be able to put all three together on one canopy. That's no longer the case, but the forms have basically stayed the same. I've kind of been lifting from my The Antlers of a Dilemma um, exhibition, taking those forms, but really pushing towards because this is a public work, yeah. everybody's going to look at it. Um, I mean, I love all those antlers sticking out of these creatures. I think it's awesome. But not everybody does. Not everybody reads it the same way. Yeah. And for me, for sure, the goal and the writing that I did in order to, to get this commission was I wanted to make something really fun and playful that sort of referenced how exciting it is when you encounter an animal in the river valley at least i'm always excited when i see something yeah. and um how fun it is to slide down hills that's the basic idea oh yeah because i would yeah, just they like the blast <laughs> i would like people to see the work and smile and and yeah. you know whether you're going to work or coming home in the morning that it offer a little bit of a bright moment in your day and uh so for me that's fairly different 
from the way I've thought about working in the past. I mean, I can, yeah, for a long time. You can see it, artist. like the shedding of the antlers, you know, especially the guy on the left. He's just, you know, he's he's having a great time. <laughs> well, that's my goal, is that they will read as as playful and not tortured, not screaming, <laughs> but, yeah. but like, or not screaming in, they're screaming out of joy, you know, yelling for joy. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, I can, you know, if we have time, I can show you the works in progress today. And uh, yeah, I've got uh, a guy, <laughs> he's actually Jill Stanton's uncle. Jill's a pretty okay. well-known artist in our community. Yeah. She's uh her uncle is doing the forging for me to create the armatures that are going to go inside these sculptures. So yeah. my process is kind of the same, although materials have shifted quite a bit because these guys are going to be exposed to the weather 365 right. days a year. So I'm right. shifting so to fiberglass as a coating. And I was just about to ask Yeah, that. my coating has changed. We're really, really concerned about water getting in anywhere so my goal is to encapsulate right. the whole object right from from hoof to antler in in fiberglass epoxy so okay. i've done an experiment it seems to work it works a lot better than i thought it would actually i'm very Good. very happy with the result so yeah i feel like this is all coming together there's still some questions to answer in terms of connection points on the roof and stuff but we're getting there and so and, and yeah, my, I hope to have it installed by September 15th. That's my goal. Oh good. Good. Well, we'll, well the I'll 14th. Have to the 15th is my word. 15th. Yeah. Okay. Uh okay, so these are um how are these made? And do they stay this color? Yeah. So I um as you said in your introduction, I was the artistic director at the Nina for a very long time. Since yeah, the beginning and had a great time there. Uh, really great time. But I realized at a certain point, because I've um, still got a young child at home. And uh, anyway, to make a long story short, I decided that I needed to take a bit of a leap and put more emphasis on my own practice before it was too late. So I started okay. calling it Freedom 50. And <laughs> I decided that I would leave my job at 50. Uh, yeah. and, and push out into the world. And so one of the things that happened to me while I was thinking about making that change is I was watching television with my son, my middle son, and he was really into this cooking show at the time. And I watched these chefs debating who would be the ultimate winner. And as they all talked about innovation, breaking with convention, challenging the viewer, all that stuff, Right. Probably the most interesting chef leaned into the group and said, you know, I think the chef's job is to bring delicious food to the table. And I sort of sat back and thought, right, I could think about that a lot more than I have. Yeah. I've been pleasing myself a lot <laughs> and not right. necessarily thinking that hard about bringing the something commercial great side. to the table. Yeah, right. and exactly. Right. Thinking about it in terms of like, if I'm going to make this shift, I have a fan fleet to be responsible to. I better figure out how to turn some of this into a way of making some money. And so mm -hmm. these candy-colored antlers um, and some of the other works I've been doing are about trying to enter that space a little bit. Could I make okay. something that uh, is pleasant and appealing and that a person might want to bring home without letting okay. go of everything I'm interested in? And, you know, right. the reality is I have these molds. They were very hard yeah. to build and very expensive to make. So the more I can make out of them, the better. Uh, and, yeah, my ambition no. for them, I suppose, in a, you know, aside from the very pedestrian, like, let's make some money. Um, I was really excited about the possibility of taking these objects that always read as kind of dangerous, hard, you know, threatening yeah. and make them feel like they were fragile. Make them feel right. like or they could palatable. they would break if they fell on the floor or melt right. if you put them in water or so to kind of use a little bit of juxtaposition in the materials yeah. choice. The reality is they're pretty tough. 
the resin's okay. pretty strong, but my goal is to make them look like they're pretty, pretty fragile. Yeah. I, we have a comment um, that they should, they should be lollipops. <laughs> mm, I've thought about it. My silicone is the wrong kind of silicone. If I were to do it safe, okay. I'd have to remake the mold in a food grade. Right. Otherwise, I don't right. know if they feel good. But it would be cool Imagine. to do a hard, like a rock Imagine. candy or something. Yeah, and Sarah's just reminding um, everyone that they, these pieces are available in the Shop AGA. Uh, it is wonderful mm -hmm. to have your artwork at an accessible price point for your fans. Well, thanks. Yeah. And uh, these are interesting, too, because... You know, visually, the hands that are supporting the ba the base of the table make me think of antlers as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a relationship there. And, you know, I showed them to uh, Heather Hamill, who's now at the oh, yeah. Spot Gallery and used yeah. to be Art Sales Rental. And her yeah. first comment was, oh, how very cocktail of you. And I said, yeah, <laughs> afraid so. <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, I want to make something that's fun and uh, viable, but I have a hard time letting go of the weird, you know. So I'm trying to bring them together. And and these uh, last that, pieces are. Sorry, sorry I have another question with regards to the hands. Um, are these molds your hands? Oh yeah, they're my mitts yeah. for sure. Okay, and is and is there, um, is there what's the context of that? What is is there um a meaning to that they're just the ones i had available yeah. <laughs> when i was making the molds no okay <laughs> no <laughs> no in fact i'd like to use some other hands yeah uh, mine are uh, another maybe question. a little are big a, sometimes are you a big bruce mm -hmm. nauman fan bruce nauman fan sure i like bruce yeah. nauman quite a bit yeah i like his um heads on the studio floor i don't know if you've seen that one it's wonderful. Oh, are they projected onto forms? The heads? Uh, they're, well, yeah, it's like a whole bunch of golden heads and it's like basically photographed. No, and they, I haven't seen that one. Oh, it's great. Uh, all right. So, and these, these are also available at the, um, at the AJ shop. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. And so, so again, it's more. Well, a silicone mold made, um, okay. you know, with the deer skull for sure. It's a question of sealing it all off so that um, the silicone doesn't leak into the pores of the bone and just get married to that forever. So varnishing and sealing and then a fairly complicated mold, right. you know, three-part mold made in latex. And, and uh, the antlers, the antler molds, all that. I mean, they're fun. I love them. But Man, they're a lot of work. It's like 50, 50 screws every time you take it apart and really long seams to clean up. And I love them, but they're a lot, a lot of labor. So the goal on these lamps was to have a mold that had no seams. Right. And so um, they're pretty simple objects. What I love about them is that every time I pour one, it's a surprise. You know, yeah. I mix up all my colors. I get all my little things together. And then... Yeah. The plastic sets up fairly quickly, so it's kind of like, okay, it's go time, let's go. And I start <laughs> pouring things in, and every time I pull the mold apart, I'm surprised at what happened inside. So I like the kind of experiment that happens. Yeah. All right, and here's the the little guy that you just showed us. Is that right? <laughs> I love it. It's like yeah, so these are... of Pinocchio. <laughs> mm hmm and mm -hmm. that whole idea of yeah things so so yeah, yeah well one thing that happened here was when i did this body of work so i worked for i guess probably at least a year at the u of a developing the exhibition mm -hmm. at a certain point i stole this process this way of working from an artist named mel chen who's in those art 21 videos okay he was talking about being blocked in his studio and he went to his friend and said, I don't, I need help. I don't know what to do. And so his buddy said, well, tell me what you love to do in the studio. And he said, well, I love to make things with my hands. And so his friend said, all right, as a way of getting unblocked, 
you're not going to make anything by hand. You're not going to do that. You're going to take your favorite thing and put it aside. Okay. And I have found that to be a very important and useful tool over the years to just ask myself, what do you love doing? <laughs> and then to just gently slap my hand and say, stop that for a little while. You know, so for a yeah. long time, I was very, very focused on copiers and scanners and like, Eventually, well, when I started my practice at the U of A, when I was doing my graduate degree, I said, okay, you love all that gear. Put it away. They're yeah. going to make you teach drawing. You better figure out what you're doing. Like, put it away. <laughs> and so I yeah. did. And likewise, with this series of children that are all infected with plant forms, I recognized right. that when I was doing these altered sculptures, my first move was always to chop the head right off. And go oh. from there, switch the heads. And so for this body of work, I said, okay, not allowed. Find a new right. answer. You know, and I think right. that's an important strategy, at least for me, to use. I find I'm recapitulating myself endlessly, so I better find new ways to do it. Right. Right? It's important to kind of shift out of your rut once in a while. So I'll often ask myself, what's my favorite thing? And then just ask myself to stop it Definitely. for a little while to Try so, something else, yeah. Well, and, and there's something about revisiting it after you've explored, whether it's drawing or writing, or it must have taken the work to a whole different level mm -hmm. after leaving it for a while. Yeah, I think so. And definitely it's been, you know, it's, I, I feel like it kind of, the that the, when you know everything, what it's going to look like before you even start, you're in a kind of a bad spot. Right. You're in a, maybe a worse spot than where you don't know what to do. <laughs> it's maybe yeah. a better spot to be in. So I think in a simple way, I try to put myself there. Yeah. Put yourself yeah. back where you don't know what to do yeah. and try to figure it out again. Yeah. Um, okay. So oh, I love I love this piece on the right. It's wonderful. What What, what can you tell us about these words? <clears throat> Right. Well, um, I did a, a little, I guess it was a class of sorts before the HDRC boondoggle that happened like at the late 90s and mm -hmm. all that money got shut down at the federal level. There was this really neat class that was offered for graduates at ACAT. So we were paid at like a part-time wage to come and do these business development classes for artists at, oh, okay. uh, at a college in Calgary. And one okay. of the guys that was teaching these classes was a photographer named Monty Green Shields. He lives in Calgary. And so I was, you know, I it was actually a pretty good, important experience for me because I started this process of like, let's figure out what your business is, artist. And I immediately did a 180 and said, well, I guess that better be a jewelry business because like, how could you make a business out of this other stuff? That's crazy. Right. And like making photocopies of dead animals, that's not a business. Yeah. And so I wrote up a whole business plan about how I was going to be a jeweler and all the things I was going to do. And it made me so unhappy. <laughs> yeah. I just threw it in the bin and I said, you no, know, my, my business is Paul Freeman makes like cinema scale images using color copiers and, dead animals that he finds on the side of the road. And that's the proposal that I ended up writing oh, or really? the business plan that, that I wrote. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> I did an exhibition at the Paul, Paul Kuhn Gallery in Calgary. I had a couple of chances to show Monty the work, not just in slide, but in the real. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, I know you're moving back to Edmonton, you know, because I wanted to be uh, near my daughter at the time. And so I was hot. To, in fact, I was driving from Edmonton to Calgary to do these classes. But regardless, I was encouraged by Monty to contact Catherine and tell her that he had told her that she needed to see my work. This is Monty so from Paul a, Kuhn Gallery? This is Monty from this business oh, class okay. in Calgary. Anyway, okay. he said, I think you're ready, Paul. You need to call Catherine and just get her to look at your work. And so I did. I phoned and I said, hi, you know, I'm Paul Freeman. And Monty Greenshields told me that I had to tell you to see my stuff. And I was able to get Catherine to come for a visit. Yeah. And maybe I brought stuff to her. I don't remember anymore. And 
it was kind of like really exciting and and then crickets i wasn't sure if i'd made an impact at all and <laughs> maybe four months later i got a phone call from Catherine, and she said i have this vision for this show i have this space for you and i want to include you in this exhibition so a year out of art school i had the chance yes. to put a this this um 740 page image up it's about 40 feet long wow. and it's all stretched out wow. uh and can you explain that process a little bit more like how would you actually um so you say when you're saying you're actually putting all of these images up it's it's in basic like it was would be like a pixelated version of the entire in image right yeah so that they very on, first they're, they're on just color copy paper just okay, 11 by 17 sheets of paper it's a nightmare uh, if you can imagine uh, trimming all those edges and can yeah. i get to light up <laughs> yeah anyway and, and, and lots of work and i'll never forget the um praise i got from Catherine when we did the show because she was like paul you just came in and banged that up like <laughs> Yeah, that would be Other that would take some time. It. Anyway, it, yeah, I had a plan and a scaffold and stuff. We anyway the the way I made it was I got I got a bunch of snakes and a bunch of mice and some seeds and some flowers and all my materials. Yeah, and then I I got a long piece of acetate that was about three times as long as the platen or the glass that's that you put stuff on when you're making photocopies right and so i would compose my image on the acetate so there's the glass the acetate and then all my stuff on top of that and make right. my pictures and then slide it all along and compose more and make yeah. more pictures and then pull it farther and so that's how i ended up with this continuous image wow. that was longer a different shape than the color copier itself and these right. pieces of paper on the wall are one generation removed from the first pictures so those old machines you could take anything that you put on the glass and have it spit out a four by four image so it would magnify right. it right from the glass four by four right. And then I took each of those 16 pages and blew them up into 16 pages, making 256 per section. And there's three sections on this, in this okay. piece. Yeah. And how so long, how long did the, did it take for you to install this piece? A day and a half, I think. Wow. Pretty quick. Pretty quick. Yeah. I took a lot longer to cut all the paper and get well, it all ready yeah. for the show. But yeah, putting it up was pretty easy. Yeah. And what about the one on the left? What is, what's this one about? Well, I, it was again, one of those moments where I was saying to myself, this was right when I was starting my graduate degree at the U of A. And I was very, very invested in this idea of, I'm going to make these weird little sculptures. And then I'm going to take those sculptures and put them in the real world. And I'm going to make a hundred million photographs of them. And then I'll collage those yeah. together into some kind of picture. And yeah. this one was a little bit different in that I started playing with scale and things like that. But I think it also became right. the piece where I was like, okay, Paul, <laughs> time to go somewhere new. <laughs> and so this was the last one. I was like, okay, no more, no more playing with computers no more playing with cameras like you're going to draw you're going to sculpt you're going to figure out how to make those things work together and so okay. for my whole time that i was studying at the u of a i sort of put all that stuff to bed but prior to that i had had a really great time playing around with reconfiguring sculptures and then uh collaging them from photographs that i'd done in either in the garden or out on a camping trip or yeah. something like that well, it certainly is all fed into your work, and and you're currently, for the most part, you are you're you're sculpting at the moment, right? That's your primary. Yeah, yeah. Art. I'm. Uh, I don't know. I'm yeah. Right now, I'm sculpting, and this LRT thing is taking over. Um, yeah. 
I think maybe well, you're down I don't to know the wire about others. Too. Other, yeah, we're down to the wire. Yeah. I think I don't know what's next, and it's it's a little terrifying, but it's also an important place to go. I'm not sure what will happen again. I've got to tell yeah. you, making big stuff has its problems. <laughs> so this idea that you could right. oh, sorry, what's just the mail. That's um, all right. This idea that you could make something digital and store it, you know, in no space has a lot of appeal. Yes. So I'm I... curious about making movies again. I'm curious about, but honestly, I don't Did, know. It must take over. Right now, it must, Yeah, it must take over your space, like your home. You, you said this has been ongoing for a couple of years now. At what point did you actually start building the sculptures well, it took a long time to get the design and fabrication packages approved because there was so much back and forth, engineers and yeah. the project team. I'm not complaining. It just it just took that long. So I think I started sculpting in earnest in like January. But there's been a lot of starting and stopping because until we know that it doesn't matter, the technical details, but right. until they're sorted, Engineering. I'd be foolish to build the arbiter. Right, It'd be foolish to go too far. So I roughed out my forms. I got the sculptures working in ways that made me happy. Right. But now I'm in the process of, of putting the armatures inside. I can't tell you how I look forward to having legs that don't snap every time I look at them. I'm it's sure. It's been very What's frustrating building the sculptures. but When you're saying so, putting the armature in, it's the metal, the metal rods for support. Well, why don't we go see? Perfect. Why don't we yes. go look? I'll take you there, so you can see my living room. And and we <laughs> and have... here's one of those really big images, right? Taking something natural and blowing it up to okay. a massive scale. I can't see what you're seeing, so that makes it harder. Oh yeah, there you go. Yeah. Oh, and is this an image or? <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> Just the guy I made. <laughs> oh, so great. Yeah, there's a few of them around in here. There's these guys. They're pretty cute. Oh, wonderful. Here's Atlas. Some, whoops, did I lose you? Know, sculptures from Nina. Lots of work from Nina in the house, of course. Yeah. And my wife, Nicole. Galelis is a very accomplished painter, so. Yeah. We have plenty of her stuff around, too. Yeah, we have and a few comments for you too as we're as we're our um and it's excited to see what's next. Uh, but, you know, thanks for all the insights you've given us into your practice over the years and so great to hear. And another saying, I really enjoyed your antler metaphor. Great work, Paul. Oh, did we lose you? It looks like we've lost Paul. There's um, so with that, um, are there any other comments that you'd like to share? Yeah, we have, it says that he's left the room. Um, so with that, um, thank you all very much for joining us and uh, I'll forward any messages that you'd like to leave for Paul. Oh, there he is, he's back. He's back to say goodbye. <laughs> Hello, Paul. Hi. Hi, we lost you there for a moment. <laughs> Sorry. No I worries. think someone unplugged my modem outside. Oh. And so I started losing my signal. It was all set up to go. Oh. Um, if people really want to see it, I'm sure I can make it happen in like two minutes, but I'll have to run and do it. We have, um, well, we're, we have six minutes. Okay. So did uh, you, I should share the comments for you as well. Sure. Uh, I don't because you wouldn't have heard them. Uh, we had a comment saying that they really enjoyed your antler metaphor and great work, Paul. Another thanks for all the insight you've given us into your practice over the years. So great to hear. Um, so and then Janet is excited to see what's next. And um, yeah, that's that's all for now. 
So if you'd like, do you, do you want to try and get it going or do you want to wrap it up? I bet it'll work. It's probably just a question of plugging one thing in. So okay. if you guys don't mind, okay. I'll run out for one minute and see if okay. we can get it to happen. Sounds great. Yeah, so as we mentioned, um, there are a few pieces, like uh, the two pieces in this slide that you can get um, at the AGA shop. So if you're if you're interested, especially like these antlers are fantastic. If you're interested, you should check them out. Um, and Sarah says, let's do it. Let's see the sculpture. There we go. <laughs> Hi, Paul, can you hear us? Yeah, it'll be really exciting. Exciting to see it, have a sneak peek of the work in advance. They just look so playful. And even just to see the scale of it. Um, I'm, I'm interested to see what the, uh, how he's supported the armature. Can you hear me? I sure can. Uh oh. Yeah. You're you're good. We have Hi. Hi. I can't hear you. Oh, do you want to check your try your audio? Oh, I turned it on again. Now I hear you. Okay, good stuff. And now your video. There we are. Hi. Yay. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> okay. All right, so let's have a sneak peek. I hope we'll make it, yeah. So far, so good. Yeah, yeah, we're doing great. Oh, it looks like we've frozen again. Uh, oh. oh oh sorry i think we're having technical difficulties here i can hear you but the the image is from oh, bummer oh wait yeah. it's on is it working now uh i can well i can I, it's mine is frozen at the moment oh it's darn there it goes um, we've lost signals, so I think we will just, um, does anyone have any comments that they'd like to leave for Paul before we wrap up today's session? Oh, it says Paul's back. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. There. It might not go. Oh, I don't know why. Oh, the joys. Sarah says the joys of internet. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, but I can see you now. It seems to be breaking up a bit, but. Oh, no, sorry. Paul has left the room again. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Um, it's been an honor speaking with Paul. I, I can hear you, Paul, but I can't. I guess it's not going to work. Sorry. No worries. No. Uh, yeah, the image is still frozen, but I we can hear you. I can still hear you. Okay. Yeah, I I guess. Sorry, it was working the other day, but no worries. That's life, eh? Well, we've had a couple of comments. Can you see saying, me now? Uh, <laughs> no. Oh, here we go. Here you are. There we are. Sorry. Hi. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so we have a couple uh, comments. A uh, home studio visit would be great, was one of them. <laughs> and uh, yeah, well, and thanks for hosting. <laughs> and then, Paul, another thing uh, a studio visit in person is, is, uh, is in order. <laughs> 
Uh, so, yeah, so I guess nice. we'll, we'll just wrap up for today, but thank you so much for taking the time. It's been, it's been okay. a pleasure talking. Well, thank you. Yeah, and... Um, well, I really enjoyed it. Likewise. And uh, the AGA, yeah, and just in closing, uh, the AGA team continues to work hard to bring you art, creative projects to do at home and engage with you daily. If you have further questions, please reach out to us at info at your AGA.ca. And is there anything more you'd like to add, Paul? No, just that, uh, again, I'm, you know, super grateful to the AGA for asking me to be here today. And uh, just to acknowledge that, you know, they have given me lots of support over the years. I'm very grateful to have them in our city. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. Thank, and thank you for sharing that. Thanks. And thanks again. Have a, a wonderful rest of your day. And until next time, stay, stay safe, stay curious, and stay connected. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Have, bye Have now. Have a great day. Bye. You too.